from the Irish Roots Cafe and www.irishroots.com, a special edition, the most famous Flanagan in America. From County Roscommon, Ireland to Omaha, Nebraska, this man just could not be stopped. If you don't enjoy this one, folks, there's not a drop of Irish blood in you. As a matter of fact, there's not a drop of American blood in you. So sit back and take a listen to a really interesting and far-ranging interview today, coming up next. I'm a graduate of Boys Town. Well, first of all, he looked more like Gregory Peck than Spencer Tracy. And he went to school with John McCormick, the great, uh, the great Irish tenor. And he was taught by the famous Father Francis Duffy of the Fighting 69th. All those Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney movies were wonderful, you know. So General MacArthur said, let's send for the world authority on youth, Father Flanagan. Yeah. One kid came out at the age of eight and a half who'd been robbing banks. Some scholars would complain they would go down to the, to the peasants in Roscommon who were, <laughs> of course, who were talking in Greek to each other. Anything about the Flanagans in Roscommon I'd be interested in. Week 68 at the Irish Roots Cafe, an interview with a man who was there, the man who knew Father Flanagan himself, and who attended the school itself. You can do no better than this, folks. A very learned scholar, Father Clifford J. Stevens. Let's begin. Well, welcome to the Irish Roots Cafe. Today we've got a very special guest, Father Clifford J. Stevens, and uh, we're going to talk to him, him today about a very famous Irishman who was also a priest. And uh, how are you doing today, Father? Fine, fine. It's a beautiful day here with uh, looks like all kinds of blossoms on the trees, like uh, like cherry, bl- cherry blossoms. Boy, as long as you don't have asthma, that's perfect. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, how did you come about uh, with this interest in uh, Father Flanagan? I'm a graduate of Boys Town. Oh, my gosh. I'll tell you how it happened. I'm from Brattleboro, Vermont, and uh, my father died when I was 10. And in 1942, when I was 15, my mother was, you know, trying to take care of seven or eight of us. I was at a parish uh, Boy Scout meeting, and I heard Father Flanagan was coming to town. So um, he was coming got there to Barry, Mary Dowd, who, who paid for the Boys Town Chapel. She happened to be from my hometown. So I walked into the hotel where he was staying the next morning and said, you, Father Flanagan, I want to go to Boys Town. It was the most famous high school in the world. Oh, right. And my mother was shocked, but she let me go. Oh, and I came out here and finished high school. He sent me to college and paid for my seminary education. Well, good. So you actually saw, listened to uh, Father Flanagan oh, speak. Well, I knew him very well. I've written a lot of articles about him and and also did a juvenile biography for the 50th anniversary of Boys Town in 1967. And I'm doing some research on his intellectual history as well. Well, now, for those of the, everybody listening that, that doesn't know any more than, and if you haven't seen the movie on Boys Town, I think you Still should. It's still a great film. But what, since you knew the actual man, what little emphasis would you say that would make a difference to the real man as opposed to the, the screen play? Well, first of all, he looked more like Gregory Peck than Spencer Tracy. <laughs> and secondly, he had a very mild uh, exterior, but he was a brilliant student. Student, a brilliant. Uh, he didn't show his intellectual gifts uh, uh, ordinarily, but when he tangled with state officials and governors and judges, it came out. He was a. He started. He started. He was from Ballymo in Ireland, and County. Ballymo was in Galway, the town, but he was born in Roscommon, just over the border. Right. And he started French, Latin, and Greek when he was 10 years old. Oh, started my. school when he was five, and uh, ended up studying at Innsbruck University in, uh, in, uh, in Austria. Uh, and, and this is the 100th anniversary of his coming home from Rome after his health, a complete break in his health. And he didn't think he could study for the priesthood anymore. And, but he finally, uh, his health got better, and they sent him to the Alps to, to uh, study. Well, that was a continuing problem, wasn't it, from his childhood? Well, when he was born, he was, they think he was a preemie, and uh, the nurse told the family uh, he, he won't last till morning. His grandfather, who had some veterinary instincts anyway, he picked him up and put him inside his flannel shirt against his chest, 
and walked up and down with him the whole night. And he was next morning, he was all right. And that's when the family said, boy, God has some great plan for this kid. Boy, and it worked out that way, didn't it? It did. Yes, it did. Yeah. Well, now, when he came to Nebraska, which is where Boys Town is, uh, wasn't he first stationed at uh, another good uh, he Irish didn't come, He didn't come directly. He, after uh, the, the Irish system, they have a primary and secondary school. Right. And the secondary school has a little bit of college in it. So he finished primary school at the age of uh, 15, age of 14, and he had turned 15 by the time the fall. He went to Summerhill College in Sligo. I'm go- I'll be going there this summer. Well, you're looking and, for information uh, on his history there, aren't you? Oh yes, I know a lot already, but I want to get the details. And sure. he went to school with John McCormick, the great, uh, the great Irish tenor. You know? Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't know that. And then he see he was he was scheduled to go to All Hallows College in Dublin, where his brother also a priest studied. It was a missionary college to train priests to go out to the Irish of the dispersion, as they called him. All over in Australia, Canada, and the United States. So, his sister had 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 migrated to the to New York and was living with some relatives. She came back and talked to him and the family into letting him go to to New York at, to study for the priesthood there. So he came over to her at the age of eighteen, and uh, he applied for um, uh, entrance to Dunwoody Dunwoody uh, Seminary in New York. But the Archbishop there said, "Well, you don't have a college degree," so he sent him to. Uh, Emmitsburg, the St. Mary's Seminary there, and he finished four years of college in two years. Then he came back to New York, entered Dunwoody, and he was taught by the famous Father Francis Duffy of the Fighting 69th. Good gosh. But his health broke. He, he visited the tubercular as part of his work in the seminary, and the high, he apparently caught some of the, some of the tuberculosis. So they forced him to leave uh, to leave the seminary. His brother had a, and his brother had a parish, and his family had come out to Omaha because his brother had a parish there. So he came out just for a rest, and um, the Archbishop of Omaha uh, caught, uh, uh, alerted him about him and got him released from New York and sent him to Rome, which was a mistake, because within six months he had double pneumonia and came back in 1908, a uh, hundred years, uh, not knowing he could ever be a priest again. Oh, so yeah. he simply grit his teeth and said, I'll wait for divine providence. Good gosh. Well, now, when when uh, you mentioned earlier, he came. You said he came over with his sister. Yes, he, he, she had. She came over when she was about twenty years old. She was quite a bit older than he was, mm-hmm. and so she went back. You know, they would go back to visit their families. She said, "Why should he study here? Let him study where he's going to work." You know. Uh-huh. So he went back. They had relatives. They had relatives in New York from Ireland. Okay. And it said he came over on the White Star Line, the, the SS Celtic. Uh, he came Celt- over on the, the, yeah, the, the SS Celtic, as a matter of fact. Right. The White Star Line. How'd you know about that? Hey, I have to do a little research before I start these talks. <laughs> oh, yeah, he came over in 1904. Yeah, yeah. Now, he was 18. And and uh, uh, so we correct the record here. We'll, get to, we'll have to straighten out the Internet. One source I have said he came over with his brother. Well, there's a picture of his brother with him uh, at the at the at the boat. Uh, I just saw it down in the boys uh, down in the boys town uh, uh, gift shop there. But I I have the uh, there's I have the um, what do you call it the the passenger list. He and his sister. I can't find his brother there, so I think his brother must have come from New York, uh, yeah. from Omaha, and met him at the at the at the ship. I think that's how sure. Happened. Sure. Oh, that's good. That's a good straighten out a little bit of mystery. Yeah. There. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, now that now the parish in Nebraska was O'Neill. That. Well, do you see the uh, the Irish priests were being trained to to take care of the uh, spiritual um, spiritual uh, ministry to the Irish scattered around the world. So. He came over, so they sent him and his brother, too, when the brother came before him, sent him to O'Neill, which is an Irish center, you know, a right. big Irish community. And then when the, an Irish priest in Omaha got sick at St. Patrick's here, less than a year, he was back in Omaha. Right, right. And and what about now, I always try to tie in all the other cultures when we're looking for something to keep everything interested. What about, I heard something about German-American house. Oh, well, but that, that'll come later when he starts Boys Town. We'll get to that. Okay, okay. Uh, what happened was in 1913, there was a drought in the Middle West, and uh, suddenly there were hundreds, thousands, hundreds of, probably, uh, of, of jobless men. Now, they were not derelicts. Or they were uh, people who followed the harvest, uh, now southwest and northeast. And the, the drought, they were hundreds stranded in Omaha looking for money, looking for a place to stay. And, and so his heart went out to them. He just... He just was shattered by, really shattered by the sight of the plight of, he had never run into human misery like that before. Mm-hmm. And so he said, we've got to do something. And so uh, 
he got some of the uh, uh, his local people's nights of uh, the St. Vincent de Paul, and he rented an old hotel in downtown Omaha while still an assistant. And and he put straw on the floor, you can sleep here. And then he got a few people organized, and uh, when the jobless men uh, left, of course, it became a refuge for alcoholics and derelicts and every kind of vagrant off the street. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's released from parish work to work full-time at that. And then uh, he tells it very, with a very moving story that he was so concerned about these men, he couldn't get over their empty lives. So he made a study of 2,000 of them. And he said, every time I looked into their faces, I saw the faces of the little boys that they were. And then a, a, a little boy wandered into his hotel, and he made sure the kid had nothing to do with the men, you know. Right. But he said, I looked at the face of that boy, and I saw those old men. And I said, I cannot let that boy become like them. And then he found there were a lot of them right after the first, during or after the First World War. They were all over the streets of Omaha being sent to reform schools. Right. He decided he closed his hotel for men, and he opened a hotel for boys. He planned to farm them out to families, you know, foster families. But he had uh, five at first, then there were 10, 20, then there were 100. You know? yeah, too, yeah, too many to possibly And, and then he, 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 he got the, 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 the house he had rented for $90 from a friend. Uh, um, uh, got the money from a friend was too small, so he was looking for a larger house. He couldn't find one, and finally, a real estate agent brought him to this huge building on South Thirteenth Street, and he was made pastor per- temporarily for the parish down in that where I was at one time too. Right. And he wa- he was going to rent him this house for a, a, a ridiculously low price. And Father Fran said, "What's wrong with the place? Nothing, Father. What? Suddenly, a a, a rock came through. It was the German American home. Germans weren't thought very highly of at that time because of the war. <laughs> so he got it dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he was a shrewd businessman. <laughs> then you see, his boys were not accepted. He had his secretary, Captain Denny, call the newspapers and find out all the prominent people when they came to down. He was down at the train with his boys band for presidents and movie stars and a- athletes. Pretty soon he was as famous as they were. <laughs> well, that's right. You know, the the last time I heard anybody mention uh, uh, Boys Town and Father Flanagan was when uh, Mickey Rooney went over to Ireland for just in the last year or so. Yes, he did. He, and uh, he and. Uh, they just had the 70th anniversary of the Boys Town movie in Dallas, Texas, and Mickey Rooney and the director of Boys Town were there. Mickey's about 90 years old. Oh. Father Bay, the new director, said he's a kid who never grew up. Yeah, they, boy, you know, some people say he was the most talented actor they ever Oh, he was, I, we all got a lot. Him and Judy Garland both. Yeah. What joy they had tragic lives, but what joy they gave us. Well, that's they right. were the, All those Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney movies were wonderful, you know. Oh, that's right. That's right. You can get them now on DVD. <laughs> and they're popular. I bet they're going. I've to- seen every one of them. <laughs> that's right there. It's almost worth renting out a theater and inviting everybody in just to have a good night and uh, watch them sometimes. And so I got here uh, uh, four years after the first movie and a year after the second. So I had nothing, but I knew a lot of the kids are in it, of course. Oh, uh, sure. How did you find it when you first ar- 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 arrived there? Well, I, I arrived. Uh, I'd never been away from home in my life. And, of course, the distant pastor of my hometown brought me down to the train and said, goodbye and good luck. And, <laughs> and I'm going out to the middle of the country. Well, I, I, the bus stopped at the foot of the hill. It's not the entrance now, but it was then. And they had another boy meet me, and he was going to be my guardian angel for the first three months I was here. Right. Break me in, you know. And so it was a – well, I met, I'd never met black kids or Indian kids or, or, uh, or Asian kids before. It was a wonderful melting pot, you know. Oh, yeah. I never met a Jewish kid before, you know. There – and uh, there was uh, this was from the very beginning. Father Flanagan um, said, "I'm not just interested in Catholic kids. Any homeless boys? Well, he was at the courtyard one t- a courthouse one time, apparently seeing a judge about some kid. He met a Jewish man named Henry Monsky, who was a lawyer and a, a great humanitarian. And and um, Henry Monsky was complaining that every time he, he was trying to place a, a homeless Jewish boys." He found out that they'd be converted, and Father Flanagan said, I don't do that, you know. Uh-huh. Well, Monsky, be, the Catholics wouldn't get behind Father Flanagan because he had mixed races. Uh-huh. Henry Monsky was his first great supporter. Probably gave him the first $90 to get his house. Well, yeah. Monsky was a great man. Now, yes, and he became Father uh, Flanagan's personal lawyer, there were, and he died a year before Father Flanagan. Didn't he? I have Monsky's, I'm looking into everything, I have Monsky's biography. And, uh, and fa- Father died in Germany, wasn't it? In 1946, General MacArthur, after the war, you see, the, the Japanese always took care of their own children. They had no history of taking care of orphans. 
You're listening to the Irish Roots Cafe at irishroots.com. This is one of three of our broadcast series. This is the Irish Families Worldwide, and we also have the Irish in America and the Irish Song and Recitation Festival for your listening enjoyment. Now let's get back to the conversation with Father Stevens. So after the war, after the bomb, there are hundreds, thousands of orphans in Japan and Korea. So General MacArthur said, let's send for the World Authority on Youth, Father Flanagan. So we went over there, and his report is quite interesting. Uh-huh. He, he, he pretty well settled the problem for General MacArthur. He came back, and in 1948, President Truman and the State Department asked him to do the same thing in Europe. Oh. Well, I, I was studying for the priesthood. He came to see me three months before he went to Europe. He said he really didn't want to go. He was tired. and and uh, But he says, how can you refuse the president of the United States? <laughs> and he died. I saw him in February, and he died in uh, in May. Oh, my gosh. And so I wrote a poem about him then. And I bet I'll that. send it to you sometime. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be good. Well, now, you, he was a great man, a remarkable man. He changed Catholic education. He changed youth work. You see, he, he was convinced that Catholic education is useless if you don't give the child character. Exactly. He would say, you know, God is truth, beauty, and goodness, and goodness has to come out of the doctrine or it's just indoctrination. And some Catholic educators disagreed, but he was right. Yeah, that's right. When he was started his work, Freud and Jung and Adler were just, weren't even into their work. He had all the insights that they had, and he would certainly, one of his great uh, uh, co-workers was a, a successor to Alfred Adler in Vienna, Dr. Franz Freyva. He came to Boystown because he had to leave Vienna. His wife was Jewish when Hitler came in. And he wrote to Father Flanagan, and Father Flanagan brought him over. But I used to ride with him when I was going to Creighton University from Boystown. And he said, Father Flanagan is one of those rare specimens that arrive only once in a hundred years. He said he was an intuitive genius. <laughs> well, he, 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 lo- he said love is the answer. You know, love is the answer. A child has to be respected and uh, given responsibility, and uh, he differed from almost, he differed with most of the psychological studies of youth. He was totally, of course, he, he hated reform schools and workhouses. Right. Breeding houses of, of uh, criminals, you know. And what, what would, say, say somebody got in trouble, and they got in trouble again, and maybe got in trouble three times, what would he do? Well, he, he, he would, he would, I'll tell you one story in a minute, but he would, he would say, bad act, not bad kid. You know, give them the right environment and the, and the acceptance. And he was right because the, the kids were really in trouble would blend in with the normal kids and become normal. Yeah. One kid came out of the age of eight and a half who'd been robbing banks. Oh, my gosh. And he was convinced he was a bad kid. And Father Flanagan saw him every single day. His name was Eddie. Eddie, you're a good boy. And finally, at her year, Eddie got mad. He came into Father Flanagan's office raging and said, Father Flanagan, you're a phony. <laughs> <laughs> and Father Flanagan, who could talk pretty tough, he said, you prove that, Eddie, or shut your mouth. He said, well, every time you come in here, you say I'm a good boy. I kicked the sister in the shins this morning. I put a knife through my geography book. I threw a rock through a window. <laughs> a good boy wouldn't do that. And Father Flanagan, who was a genius, he said, okay, Eddie, what is a good boy? A good boy is... An obedient boy, isn't he? And Eddie says, yeah. He does what teacher tells him. He said, well, Eddie, if that's the standard you live by, you've been a good boy. You listen to every feudum and ruffum and criminal you ever come across, but you've been a good boy. But you've had the wrong teachers, but you've done every rotten, dirty thing he ever told you to do. <laughs> now, if you would be, uh, uh, listen to the teachers of Boys Town, the way you listen to those teachers, you'd be a good boy. According to the story, the kid was shot, cried like a baby, and was still tough. <laughs> yeah, that boy, that's cool. He joined the Marines. <laughs> oh, and came out pretty darn good, I bet. Well, he had that way. There was a way about him. Uh, he, he didn't lose uh, confidence in a kid. Mm-hmm. And he would go around the country. He was dying, just about dying in the early 1930s. He had to go for a mo- weeks and months to Denver in the hospital. But a little kid in Seattle, 12 years old, had shot, uh, shot a policeman dead in an in a, uh, apartment store. You know, had no 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 dis- no uh, discipline and no, no supervision. They were going to execute the kid. He went up and went out there. He didn't get the kid, but he made the state finally uh, uh, did something about him and put him in uh, you know in, in protection until he was 21. But he went all over the country fighting for kids really bad. Those that what people would consider bad, you know. Right. Well, sometimes it only takes just the fact that you know one person believes there's something. Well, there. most of these kids, every many of them. Uh, 
uh, every every contact with an adult was a brutal one, you know. Mm-hmm. I didn't trust adults. And once you start off on the wrong road, you, it's it's hard to turn it around sometimes. Well, he saw those old men. What happened? Most of them had been in reform schools, you know, but they had no loving and, and dedicated parents. Yeah. Boy, that's, yeah, boy, that's, you know, it sounds like common sense almost, but. It, it, well, his secret was, I think, he saw the possibilities in a kid. That's what he worked at. Mm-hmm. He saw that kid that came in off the street. He saw the tremendous possibilities that were there. And he finally, you know, by his attitude, convinced the kid. So Boys Town graduates have done many fabulous things, doctors, lawyers, you know, everything. The 13 priests. <laughs> well, that's right. Now, is there, if somebody wanted to help Boys Towns today, how would they do it? Just send whatever they want to send to Father Flanagan's Boys Town, Boys Town, Nebraska, 68010. And it'll get right there. You just bet it will. (laughs) And not only that, now there are about 21, 18 or 19 or 21 mini campuses all over the country that Boys Town is in charge of. Oh, good, good. And it's going national, and and they help, I suppose, 50 or 100,000 kids a year through their uh, hotline and things like that. Father Flanagan, one time talking to President Roosevelt, whom he had known since President, well, the President was Secretary of the Navy, said he wanted uh, Boys Towns in all, that time, all 48 states. And President Roosevelt said, well, Father, we need 49 more Father Flanagan. <laughs> but that would, we, the, those sites, they, uh, Boys Town works with local, local uh, communities and, uh, and uh, you know, brings these kids back. Uh, and, and Father Flanagan would argue, well, you know, give me money to take care of my boys, and you'll save the government thousands of dollars that's, well, later that's on. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's he right. had a lot of wonderful uh, sayings like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, when you have some foresight, it changes everything. Yeah. Uh, now, and it was also interesting, I found out, that, uh, see, he came back from Rome 100 years ago uh, this month, this year, and he was not sure he could study for the priesthood. Well, his health got quite improved, and so they decided they'd send him to a healthy climate. They sent him to the Tyrolean Alps in in, uh, in But he promised God at the time, he said, if you will restore my health so I can be a priest, I'll make sure that every child that my life touches who hasn't had the, the, the wonderful home life that I've had, that I will make up for that. So there was a seed there, you see. Oh, yeah. He knew what he had. Well, he had... An amazing education. Uh, most people don't realize that the classic education had never left Ireland. Every priest educated in Ireland was educated with the classics, you know. Yes. They knew Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, and they had an epic concept of priesthood. They were not just people in the sacristy and, and, convey, and doing the sacraments. They were involved in the community. And he, had the, he never lost that epic sense, and he had models, models, you know, like St. Columkill and, yeah. and, uh, and uh, the great saints of Ireland. And, uh, well, and that, they, that education goes all the way back to the head schools where they taught. Well, you see, when, when they couldn't educate their own, they, they started the head schools, and the head schools taught Latin, Greek. <laughs> That's right. It's amazing. <laughs> Some scholars would complain they would go down to the, to the peasants in Roscommon who were, <laughs> of course, who were talking in Greek to each other. That's right. It's amazing. Yeah, I've read more than one account. And, there, and you see, literacy is the ba- was the basis of the, of, of the great uh, Celtic uh, uh, period of, of Christianity. Literacy was on the top. The, when, when the classics died on Europe, it was Irish scholars who went and restarted at, uh, at the court of Charlemagne, at at a federation of monasteries from Regensburg to the Balkans at St. Gall Monastery, and many of the Irishmen founded the, were the basis for some of the universities in Europe. They were the most learned people in Europe, but you see the Normans came in in the 1200s, and, every, and they put Irish, in, Irish into poverty. They were pirated for a thousand years. Oh, yeah, that was the beginning of the end, and you get down to the 1700s, and it's just totally gone. Well, Father Flanagan was of royal blood. Oh yeah, the Flanagan. He was uh, he was descended to the to kings of Connacht. Right, the O'Connors. And uh, the uh, Flanagan, the O'Con, the, the O'Connors. The Flanagans were descended from Cashel, the son of a king who died Muradic in 701, and eventually, in direct line, they became the heads of the uh, clan Cathal. And Flanagan means red. Either somebody had red hair or a ruddy face, and uh, they were one of the twelve uh, uh, lords of Crohan and the chief steward of uh, of the kingdom of Connacht, and they. Their, their territory was around Elfin in, 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 in Roscommon. But uh-huh. when the Normans came in, when, when uh, Rory, o, Rory O'Connor lost the battle uh, with uh, King of Leinster, if you remember, right. um, he brought in, uh, King of Leinster brought in, the, brought in Henry II, 
And then, of course, all of that was suppressed, and the the Flanagan then became impoverished and, uh, and obscure. But they stayed around that area. Well, that, you know, I've got a book here. I had one fellow over in uh, England, Edward Nefsey, uh, did a little analysis of the, of the Flanagan, and it's got he did. it's got little dots everywhere they they appear in Ireland on based on 2200 families who had phone lines back in 92. Uh, oh, I'd like to see that. Well, yeah, I can get you a copy of that for sure. Yeah. There of course a lot of them are centered in Dublin like everybody is, but the highest Well, the Flanagan the, his his branch were there in Roscommon and they're still there, of course. That's right. They have the heaviest They remained around the See the headquarters is Curahane. The mm-hmm. the Tain boys at the Curahane, Queen Maeve, Queen, Queen Maeve remember in that whole marvelous incident in, in the Tain Bow, right. uh, Cahoolin and all of that. Now, have you taken some courses in Irish history? I've been reading up on it for about 20 years. <laughs> I, can tell. I can tell. I have a book called The Harp of Brennick, which is about the, it's a novel about the, uh, the, the Celtic monastic period, because that was the seed of everything that happened in Christian Ireland. Mm-hmm. They had dozens of educational centers all over Ireland. Yeah. They educated boys and girls from the continent. Yeah, and, well, I, and, I, and the and the sons of uh, carpenters would sit beside the sons of kings. Colin Kilby was the son of king. Karen was a son of a of, of a of a carpenter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so many of them went from Ireland to the continent to uh, to study, and then came back. Well, and then they and they they evangelized Europe. That uh, federation of, of Saint Mary and Scotus had twelve monasteries right into the Balkans. They not only, see, the great genius of the Irish monks is they created a culture where the faith could grow. Uh They didn't just evangelize, they agriculturized and and, and stabilized the economy. They were amazing people. That's right, that's right. It's it's a it's a quite a story. And they were masters of many many different kind of uh, areas of knowledge. Um, Virgilius of uh, Salzburg, of all places, you know, he was a great cosmographer. He knew the world was round. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're looking for. We've got thousands of researchers out there listening in right now, and you're looking anything for, about the Flanagans and Ross Common, I'd be interested in. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I can make you some. Co- I've got so much stuff here. I. Don't, <laughs> I'll give you everything I can. <laughs> but right now I'm trying to find out what the – and I'm getting a book on that. The the, the the school system is primary and secondary. It's not exactly like ours. I'm not sure how many grades were in the primary school, but he had a sister who became a teacher and came back to uh, Ballymo or back to that area and taught him too. Uh-huh. And he was reading Macaulay, Dickens, and Scott when he was 12 years old. Boy, isn't that – that makes a difference. Everything he could get his hands on. He was hugely well-read. Which and I then he became him? a priest – at the height, uh, I mean, he'd been studies for the priesthood, at the height of the patristic renaissance and the Thomistic renaissance at the turn of the century. Cardinal Newman was responsible partially for the uh, patristic renaissance and Leo XIII, hopefully. For, uh, so he, he got the best of the learning of his times. And what is indicative of the Summa Theologica is that the Summa Psychologica too? That whole area of human behavior is a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Well, he was educated by that kind of mind. Well, I hope uh, somebody out there can help you with this. Uh, anything on the Flanagan clan anciently, or anything on Father Flanagan's family? Anything up, 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 that would throw light on the period. See, he was in Ireland from he born eighteen eighty six to about. Uh, the end, of the, the end of the of the nineteenth, uh, and the beginning of the. Of the I, I'm getting. I have a lot of books. I just got uh, from some of the great famine, and I've got the. See, the Celtic revival under Ye- Yeats and others was just about when he was six years old, but he must have been affected by it, mm-hmm. because along with the literary revival, there was a religious revival, very, very rich. You know, the the Book of Kells, the Art of Chalice, uh, all of those. I believe, and I think I can prove it, that that period in Irish history is comparable to classical Greece. Oh, my. I'm sure of it. Well, look at the artwork. The great, very great crosses, you know. Right. Uh, the Book of Lines, all these various books. There must be two dozen. Book of Lines to the Book of High Many. All of those, you know. Look what the speck was something else. Um, but they were very, very learned. They were poets. <laughs> you know, they were oh, artists. Yeah. Oh, many and, poets, yeah. But most of this stuff was destroyed by the Vikings and the Normans. Con McNoise, which is 35 miles from Garbally Mall, was sacked by the Vikings, then sacked by the Normans, and then destroyed by the English in 1553, who leveled every building, two or three dozen of them, stole all of their artworks, and uh, uh, Con McNoise was older than Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge. It lasted for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. An educational center. That's right. Well, Where I education was free. 
the the, the, <laughs> the, the yeah, you ever heard of the Four Masters? Oh, that's one of the great collections of the genealogy. I'm looking for a copy. <laughs> that's right. I've got a couple. Well, I'd, like, I'd like to consult it anyway. <laughs> I, there's plenty of references to O'Flanagan in there. I'll tell you, I looked just before I uh, got a hold of you here, and I go, good gosh, I can't possibly read all that right well, now. Well, I haven't got the, the, the details of the line. I know the general line from Capital Son of Miradek, and then the heads of the of the, of the uh, Capital Clan, Clan Capital. I don't know the, the names and that's not important. I know the general line anyway. He was that's, of royal blood. That's right. And that's about as far as you can take it because uh, yeah. sometimes those names in between get turned around. Well, I can't go back beyond his grandfather. Mm-hmm. And you see, his mother was a Larkin. And if you know, if you, if you read The Great Shame, you know, uh, Hugh Larkin is one, one of the heroes of that book. Well, Larkin's another Galway name, too. Uh, yes, we'll see the Larkin of Galway and Parts of Love. And there's a Byrne in there. One of his grandmothers was Mary Byrne. I'm trying to find, and I'm in, I'm in touch with the Larkin clan too in, in the United States. So. Oh, good. But I, I just want to know all the influences on him, you know, sure. religious, and uh, he would uh, go on. And of course, he was very frail, so his father had him watching the sheep. But he, but he bring his books out and read, you know. Gosh, he sounds like St. Patrick sitting out there herding the sheep. Well, St. Patrick is one of see the, the Irish. The priest that they had a, a very elevated concept of priesthood, epic, mm-hmm. I call it epic, you know. When he came to this country, he was not surprised that he had to associate with presidents and Hollywood stars and military generals, but he was an equal among them. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of good sense there. Yes. <laughs> a lot of that has to do with being Irish, too. Well, and, and being knowing, knowing that, that his work was as important as anything going on in in the in the city at the time, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. his work as a priest was enduring, you know. That's well, you, yeah, he wasn't dazzled by the bright lights, and that's no, he wasn't, he wasn't, and he would listen to anyone and read. He had a fantastic library. He liked biographies and histories in particular. Hmm. Well, I think that probably wraps us up for the day. Uh, you want to give us an address again, or email, or so, well, the email for Boys Town is uh, Father Flanagan's Boys Home, Boys Town, Nebraska. Six eight zero one zero. Got it. And I'm one of the products. <laughs> <laughs> You're a living, a living, not a living relic, a real living thing. Boy, I tell well, you. Well, I, I think he has to become more visible because he's such a model for priesthood. A priest here who lives next door to me, a very old, old tree, wonderful monsignor. He was study. He worked under Father Flanagan. He said every day. He would try to get to the chapel before him. If he were there at 5 o'clock, Father Flanagan was there. If he were there at 4 o'clock, Father Flanagan was always in the chapel before him. He was a man of deep prayer. Well, how many uh, 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 children are there now? There are about 500 on the home campus, but all over the country there are you know, the 21. There's probably, I suppose, 20, many, as many as 20 of the, those sites. So, But it's a, it's a family setup. There are family teachers have their own children, and they take five or six boys or girls, and they turn these kids around. Not only that, let me tell you a story. Do you have a minute? Sure, go right ahead. There was a young boy here about 10 years ago, and he, about 12 years ago, he hated the place. So he told his counselor, family counselor, I'm going to leave. The counselor said, you well, young man, before you, you can leave any time you want. There are no, no walls around here. But before you do that, you better go to the chapel and say a prayer. He didn't get back in an hour and said, I'm going to stay. And the consul said, what changed the one? He said, Father Flanagan did. Mm-hmm. The Father Flanagan's been dead for 50 years, uh-huh. 60 years. And what, kind of, what do you mean? He said, well, I was kneeling in the back row, and this has happened to a couple of children. He came down the middle aisle and put his hand on my shoulder and said, I think you'd better give the place a try. Well, Father, the consul thought, well, it's probably one of the priests. How do you know that was Father Flanagan? They had these huge poster-sized pictures of him. Mm-hmm. He said, that guy right there. Good. That's happened two or three times on the witness of the children. <laughs> right, right. Okay. He's looking after the place. <laughs> well, hey, I wouldn't put it uh, past. No, that's. Uh, and he was he was also very shrewd or very humble. Can I tell you another story? Sure. Yes. Yes. I went out to California once, 1960, and uh, one of the first mayors of Boys Town, Tony Valoni, worked in the MGM studios. He went back with Spencer Tracy and Frank Whitmarsh of MGM and got a job in the art department, so I could go in and out. Mm-hmm. So I was across the street there after I'd visited, and there was a little music shop there, and a man sitting in front, and we started chatting, and I mentioned I was from Boys, and he said, oh, Father, that's very interesting. He said, I'm retired now, 
But I used to be the man in MGM who had to who had to pass the music we used to make sure it was not copyrighted. He said, and in 1937 he said, Joan Crawford, Father Flanagan was out here. He said in Hollywood, they're making the movie, and Joan okay. Crawford came to back and said to me because she knew me, we're having a reception for Father Flanagan. And he he told me the man told me we all went in and we and she said all of the stars pressed huge checks in his hand. Well, Father Flanning was never going to take advantage of anybody. He thought he had taken advantage of them. He sent the checks all back. Oh. When he got back to Boys Town, they'd been returned doubled in size. Good <laughs> gosh. <laughs> but that's the kind of – and he, he would hire the best people to take care of his boys. When he needed a great football coach, Skip Powering the time was coach of uh, – Creighton University football team. He was retired. Well, not retiring. They were getting rid of their football team. He had offers from up the great universities of the country. Father Flanagan lured him out here, and Skip became the great new Rockney of high school football. Good gosh. I didn't know Excellence that. is what he aimed for in everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he didn't lose sight. No, and he died very young. He was only 62 when he died. Yes, yes. You know what he said to me when he visited me? In, uh, what? He said, young man, you're 21 years old and you're studying for the priesthood. You should be very, very grateful to God, he said. And I have a dream, too. And I said, what's that? He said, I think I'd like to join a Trappist monastery before I die. And I said, you do? He said, yes, I want to save my soul, too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, we can use a few more like you and Father (laughs) Flanagan. Well, he's a great model, I can tell you that. Well, that's, yeah. that's what it takes. Yes. Well, thanks for setting this up. I hope it does a lot good for you. Well, sure. Oh, I'm sure it will. And uh, this will be playing all year long, so people will come along and hear it and uh, either contact me well, or Boys Town. Tell them to go out and get a DVD on Boys Town. It's still a great film. Oh, and there's some right. information on the DVD about Boys Town of today. So. Hey, how about the follow-up they did on the in, in that's years? also That's also in the DVD. They have both oh. Boys Town and Men of Boys Town. Oh, Men of Boys Town, and, too. And, okay. Yeah, and they also have a little thing called the city of little men which is kind of a little feeler for the movie and but they have a lot about uh boys town of today too i'll be doggone yeah. well yeah that's that's a good one i'll have to go listen to that i might just run out that little theater here in kansas city and uh once a year i, I either get the quiet man or some other uh film i might do boys town this year and invite people in and uh it's still a great film it holds up pretty well it is one well, of the greatest I... lines in it is in the beginning when this this man is about to be executed. He says to Father Flanagan, "What's it like?" Father Flanagan says, "Well, people in a million years have been worrying about that, and you can't figure it out in five minutes." And he says, "But eternity begins in forty-five minutes." <laughs> <laughs> Boy, the older we get, the more we know that's true. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. Gee, this has been great. Okay, thanks a lot. I do appreciate okay, it. Okay, right. Bye now. God bless you. Bye. Well, thanks for listening in today, folks. I really appreciate it. Uh, Just remember, there's no such thing as a bad boy, and eternity begins in the next 45 minutes. That sure puts a new perspective on things. Well, I think I will rent out a theater and show Boys Town. That'd be a worthy project, and all the members are invited to uh, come on in. I'll take care of your admission into the door. The rest is on you, the popcorn and the Coke. I'll let you know when that's going to happen. And uh, just a reminder that there's a lot of things coming up this week. The National Genealogical Society uh, Convention in Kansas City, May 14 to 17. See me at booth 215. And the Kansas City Outdoor Literary Festival on the Plaza, May 17th. I'll be there with our display in hand and a lot of fine Irish books right up near the main stage. And, yes, we're going to be at the Dublin, Ohio Uh, Irish Festival again in August. I think that's going to be our 10th year invited back. We'll see you there. And remember to send your comments by clicking the contact link on our webpage at irishroots.com or send to our American address at the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave your message or report on things in your part of the world. When you call my phone recorder at 816-256-3360 or Skype me at Mick the Bridge. Members foot the bill so they get first priority, but we're open to all. And by the way, a big thank you to all of our members. And away.